Keeping in Step with Susan. A presentation by Colonel John R. Bourgeois, Director Emeritus, the President's own United States Marine Band. November 6, 2004 marked the sesquicentennial of the birth of John Philip Sousa. Born in Washington, D.C., November 6, 1854, Sousa went on to become America's musical phenomenon. He defined the American march style and became a world figure of enormous musical celebrity. As we observe this Sousa anniversary year, we are given a wonderful opportunity to review how he became the most successful musician of his day and how his combined skill as a composer and inspiring conductor won him the title March King. The accomplishments achieved by Sousa and his band inspired the European author Heinrich Jakob to write, quote, His was a band of powerful wind instruments. These, however, were not only the most powerful but also the most delicate the world has ever heard. The thunder of the Rocky Mountains, the sighing of the west wind, and the pianissimo hum of metallic dragonflies' wings were reproduced." End quote. One aspect of Sousa's success was his programming of familiar along with new music. Another aspect that was unique has been called the Sousa style. Sousa composed a variety of music in addition to his marches, and the bulk of his output is readily available. However, there remain questions as to how he performed it. There are contradictory observations in several eyewitness reports regarding the definitive interpretation of the Sousa style. Yet I believe that, other than the recordings of the Sousa band itself, we can rely on two invaluable sources for information. The most specific information comes from Frank Simon in his essays on the 36 Sousa marches that are included in the Sounds of John Philip Sousa, a series recorded by the United States Army Band and produced by the American School Band Directors Association in 1967. Our second specific source is from the Sousa Encore books that are housed in the United States Marine Band Library in Washington, D.C. Frank Simon had been one of the Sousa Band cornet soloists, and it was largely through his efforts that Sousa's march interpretations have been kept alive. Additionally, both Keith Bryan and Frank Byrne have invested time and scholarship in researching and fathoming just what was the true Sousa performance style. I especially recommend to you Frank Byrne's essay entitled, Sousa Marches, Principles for Historically Informed Performance in the Wind Ensemble and its Repertoire, edited by Chipola and Huntsberger. Mr. Sousa said, quote, a march is the most difficult of all music to interpret, end quote. And he was as meticulous in rehearsing his marches as he was with the other music on his programs. A Sousa march requires careful preparation and rehearsal. Without paying attention to characteristic devices found in the music, a Strauss waltz would not be a Strauss waltz, and the same is true for a Sousa march. When Sousa conducted his own music, he would give elaborate verbal instructions on note lengths, accents, and interpretation. In an essay entitled, Sousa Marches as He Conducted Them, Keith Bryan states, quote, Sousa conducted his music with his own band more often than any composer in history. When he wrote a new march, the published parts were thickly orchestrated with outdoor marching in mind. Sousa's band, however, was exclusively a concert band, playing mainly in concert halls, theaters, and opera houses. Therefore, during the first rehearsal of a newly composed march, Sousa would verbally indicate various changes to his players, radically changing the orchestration for indoor performance. The changes included deletions and doublings, octave switches, and changes of texture, dynamics, and accents. The repeated strains were reorganized to enhance the progression of musical ideas. The process allowed the march to reach its fullest concert hall potential and created the Sousa sound. It made Sousa's performances of his own music unique." End quote. Gus Helmica, the legendary bass drummer in Sousa's band, informs us, quote, Sousa wrote for performance, not for publication. In odd moments on trains and hotel rooms or shipboard, 
he'd simply jot down his immortal themes and hand them over to the band copies, and then snap right into action on them. Consequently, when they came to be published, nothing but the notes got onto the printed page." End quote. This statement readily explains the absence of consistency regarding dynamic markings and coordinated accents in the manuscript scores and also in the published materials. We must also remember that Sousa's marches were published not to duplicate his concert performance style, but to provide an addition that could be played effectively by small bands or on the march. In a letter to a fellow bandmaster, Carl King observed, quote, In his marches, Sousa pulled some strains down to a whisper, which always made the last strain sound that much heavier by contrast. Also, Sousa had a few little tricks on pianissimos that I always wondered why other leaders who heard him didn't get help to how he did it, but apparently they didn't." End quote. As mentioned earlier, all of the Sousa marches were originally published in small quick-step editions where the band plays with numerous doublings and the subtleties of dynamic or instrumental contrast are seldom indicated. Sousa made numerous performance changes in his marches when he performed them with his band. There were many doublings in the instrumental parts, which reinforced the melody by having multiple players on the same line. But when he performed his marches with his own band, he used a consistent style in which he altered the dynamics and had the melodic brass instruments lay out in the softer strains. Additionally, he often had the upper clarinet parts play down the octave to produce a richer and mellower sound. The goal of these changes was variety and contrast. Repeated strains seldom were played the same way, and there was always the element of contrast. For the softer strains, where the melodic brass is not playing, the woodwind should seek a rich, warm sound that has texture and depth. The tone quality has to be preserved even in the softest playing. And when it comes to the final strain, you might ask that the cornets, trumpets, and trombones lift their bells on this last time through as it adds additional brilliance. I'm sure some of you have been subjected to my screed regarding properly researched performance materials. Unfortunately, many of the editions of Sousa's marches published after his death contain numerous unauthorized changes, even to include additional parts not written by Sousa. The most glaring is the infamous 1951 edition of The Stars and Stripes Forever which contains ten instrumental parts that are neither in Sousa's original manuscript nor in the first published edition. Especially offensive are the trumpeting parts in the soft trio that someone anonymously created out of whole cloth. Former members of the Sousa band rose up in arms at the 1952 meeting of the John Philip Sousa Fraternal Society and issued the statement, quote, Dr. Goldman asked us to do everything in our power to stop publishers from murdering Sousa's marches." End quote. Alas, the homicide continues. Besides the seemingly frivolous approach to musical alteration and changing of the original keys, there is another performance practice which has sprung up which I feel must be commented on. Sousa never, I repeat, never, made an accelerando in the final strain of any of his marches. I'm afraid that some of us are confusing Suzu with Henry Fillmore. There are several imperatives to strive for in attempting the Suzu performance style in his marches. They are tempo, rhythm, accents, dynamics, special effects, stylistic effects, and deorchestration. Tempo. The Sousa Band made nearly 1,200 recordings for the Victor Talking Machine Company over the years, but as we have come to know, Sousa only conducted on a half dozen or so of these recordings. Arthur Pryor, Herbert L. Clark, Walter Rogers, and other Sousa Band members conducted the remainder. Of all of the Sousa Band recordings, two stand out. On September 6, 1918, Sousa conducted and recorded the marches Solid Men to the Front and Saber and Spurs. The two most interesting observations of these recordings are tempos and rhythm. Sousa band members reported that Sousa conducted his marches anywhere from 120 to 126 beats per minute. 
In his later years, the tempos often increased to 132 beats per minute. However, the two recordings with him actually conducting ranged between 112 and 118 beats per minute, considerably slower than any of the other recordings. Memories of the Sousa Men aside, I feel that these recordings speak for themselves and that these are the tempos Sousa would have chosen for a concert performance of those marches. Further, most of his marches were performed as encores, where we know he took faster tempos. We also know that when playing the marches as encores, he sometimes eliminated first endings in the first and second strains. Further evidence for the more moderate tempos can be found in the one recording of Sousa conducting The Stars and Stripes Forever. And that recording is clocked at 120 beats per minute. Rhythm. The rhythm must be as steady as possible throughout the march and a thoroughly consistent tempo will help to achieve that goal. The Sousa band recordings do demonstrate some stylistic and interpretive devices that compress certain rhythms and expand others. However, the most important thing is that these changes are accomplished within the framework of a consistent beat. These slight hesitations and other mannerisms seem to pull shorter valued notes toward the strong beats, giving a certain lift and dance-like character to the music. These effects are very difficult to quantify, more difficult to explain, and nearly impossible to reproduce. Accents if used correctly and judiciously, the accents in the Sousa marches make them more exciting and interesting. Some of the accents are, in some cases, just a matter of bringing out what is already written in the part, while others are added for a variety. This is often difficult because the key accents performed by Gus Helmica were never written in the printed versions of the marches. Helmica maintained that Sousa refrained from writing in the accents because he didn't want any other band to play the marches the way his band did. And in the era of competition among the bands, these trade secrets were highly valued. Leonard Smith, conductor of the Detroit Concert Band, knew many of the Sousa band members, and he also performed with Gus Helmica in the Goldman Band for many years. Regarding the use of accents in the marches, Dr. Smith commented, quote, The Sousa accents were placed logically, not whimsically. The interpretation is found within the music itself and has nothing to do with sentiment or caprice. Sousa's accents were so effective because he conceived them. People fantasize that Gus created them, but that is not true. Sousa originated the accents in all of his marches." End quote. Several of the later editions of Sousa marches contain drum parts as edited by Gus Helmica. These additions are worthwhile for the accents in the drum part, but the other instrumental parts are better obtained from earlier editions. Dynamics All dynamic changes should be exaggerated in order to convey a dramatic and audible change to the audience. Dynamics in the Sousa marches are as important as in any other piece of music, and the orchestral changes make it possible to achieve some wonderful effects. If it is necessary to reduce the number of players on each part in a particular strain to get the volume down, do so. The most important thing is to have a wide range of dynamics and to keep the tempo steady. The march should not slow down when playing softly and not speed up when playing the loud passages. A bit of advice. Use a metronome on the podium and consult it often. Also, don't allow the percussion section to overshadow the band when playing fortissimo. Special effects. Many of the Sousa marches have distinctive and interesting features that add a great deal to the concert performance of the work. These include regimental trumpet and drum parts, which can be played by a separate section of the band, horses' hooves, the use of orchestra bells or a ship's bell, bosun's pipe, whistles, ratchets, sirens, pistol shots, and more. In addition, several of the Sousa marches contain published harp parts that are quite interesting and add a great deal to the texture of the march. Sousa also often surprised his audience with the inclusion of a xylophone solo in one strain of one of his marches. Let's listen to a recreation of Sousa's march and performance, Saber and Spurs, where we hear regimental trumpets and drums, horses' hooves, and the xylophone surprise.
Stylistic effects. In general, the note values in the marches should be played shorter than written in order to achieve lightness to the sound. Sousa was insistent that his players put what he called daylight between the notes. Frank Simon commented, quote, it used to burn the governor up when one of his players would fail to space his notes, end quote. One of the most effective devices used by Sousa's drummers was the five-stroke roll with flam attack. This device was used in the last strain of nearly all of the marches. In his book entitled The Correct Way to Drum, John Heaney explained it this way, quote, On the plain five-stroke roll, you were taught to accent the last beat very forcibly, which is correct. On the five-stroke roll with a flam attack, we reverse the procedure and accent the first of the roll or the flam beat itself. This note should be accented with a considerable force, and then the rest of the beat is decrescendoed down to the last beat, which is played about one-fourth as heavily as the start of the beat." End quote. Deorchestration. The deorchestration device in general can be outlined as follows. The introduction and first strain are played as written. At the pickups to the second strain, the cornets and trombones do not play, and the clarinet parts are taken down the octave if they are written above the staff. The dynamic level should be mezzo forte. For the second time through the second strain, the brass is back in, clarinets played at the upper octave, everyone playing forte or fortissimo. At the trio, clarinets are again down the octave and the solo and first cornets do not play. The Simon information has the cornets and trombones out altogether at the trio, yet in some cases I have elected to leave in the second and third cornets playing very softly and the trombones as well, and very softly. In some cases, the trombone part of the trio is different than the part in the last strain, and if the trombones do not play at the trio, the entire line would not be played in the march. Keeping the trombones in at the trio also adds a nice texture. Some of the Sousa recordings have the trombones in softly, so I believe that is a valid option. At the breakup strain, or dogfight, everyone is in at the dynamic mark. In some cases, Simon instructs different changes, but I elect to play them as printed. In the final strain, cornets are out the first time through, clarinets playing in the staff, everyone playing mezzo forte. The last time through, everyone plays as written. These are very general instructions that do not apply categorically to every march, but they do serve as an outline of the general changes that were employed. Some of the orchestration devices that Sousa employed in the performance of his marches can be found in the manner similar to how he orchestrated his concert music. If we examine the manuscript score of the suite Looking Upward and contrast it to the two earlier published versions, Church 1904 and Chapel 1905, we encounter many subtle discrepancies and differences. However, the manuscript edition has a full score in Sousa's hand and the manuscript parts that were always used throughout his performance career and is the basis for my Winger Jones edition, the first difference we find is in the instrumentation. Sousa's original manuscript calls for a full symphonic band instrumentation, while the church and chapel are military band instrumentation with many doublings. Further, church and chapel have condensed scores that are not consistent one to the other. Where Sousa designates flugelhorn, the other two give an important solo to the second baritone in one and the second cornet in the other. Sousa requires all flutes to change to piccolos and gives them a four-part bravura section while church and chapel call for only a piccolo duet. The difference between the manuscript version of Looking Upward and the early published versions might best be described as the difference between playing the marches literally as they appeared in print with the many 2 d doublings, as opposed to how Sousa interpreted them with his own band. Programming Sousa In March 1996, the American Sonic Society had its annual meeting in Washington, and the Marine Band was requested to present a concert of American music. I attempted to create a program that concentrated on band music that had disappeared from frequency in programming. The program. The Commando March of Samuel Barber. Cimarron Overture by Roy Harris. 
Tonbridge Fair by Walter Piston, Little Piano Concerto, Henry Cowell, Chorale and Alleluia, Howard Hansen, The Intermission, Omega Lambda Chi, Charles Ives, a Stephen Foster songbook, Stephen Bullock, a suite, People Who Live in Glass Houses, John Philip Sousa, Jubilee from Symphonic Sketches, George W. Chadwick, and The Stars and Stripes Forever, John Philip Sousa. People Who Live in Glass Houses, subtitled a Bacana Suite, is an original band suite in four movements that is in manuscript and had never been published or recorded. What I discovered was a delightful original band score that dated to 1909. While the Sousa Suite was perhaps the lightest number on the concert program, it was not without a degree of musical sophistication and nuance. It is wonderfully scored and furthermore, it was the hit of the program for that musically sophisticated audience. The first movement, the Champagnes. The second movement, the Rhine Wines, Tempo Rhinelander Schottisch. Third movement, the Whiskies, Scotch, Irish, Bourbon, and Rye. And the fourth movement, Convention of the Cordials and Wines. Sousa concerts with diversity and programming were entertainments of the highest order. The concerts were highly subscribed and presented in diverse formats such as theaters, opera houses, music halls, coliseums, and armories. Summer venues were held at Willow Grove, Manhattan Beach, and the Steel Pier in Atlantic City. He featured brilliant violinists, operatic divas, percussion soloists, wind and brass virtuosi, and even a saxophone octet. Paul Byerly tells us, quote, the Sousa band programs were eclectic in nature, and Sousa was a shrewd programmer. The tour programs usually consisted of nine selections, not counting encores, and were continually updated with a new trend in music. He was quick to program ragtime music. He capitalized on the increased popularity of jazz, but was cautious about endorsing it. He slighted no musical form, believing that the secret of success of nearly any type of music lay in its treatment. Everything was played to perfection without regard to its musical importance. In gleaning over many of Sousa's programs, both with the Marine Band and with the Sousa Band, we find that the programs themselves resemble musical menus. There are elegant categories for the music that are no longer in use today. Besides listings as uh, overture, selections, ballet music, patrol, or march, we find pieces listed as a collation, mosaic, melange, collage, ballade, song, romance, chaconne, morceau, fantasia, fantasy, caprice, and potpourri. I could think of no better tribute to the March King in this celebratory year than to program a concert of Sousa's music. While there have been many Sousa-style concerts in imitation of his programming, there have been very few all Sousa programs. Sousa contributed a wealth of music to include original compositions, arrangements, and transcriptions that could make a delightful and rewarding concert program, such as Nikolai's Merry Wives of Windsor or Wagner's Tannhäuser, a selection, The Bride Elect or El Capitan, a descriptive piece, Ben Hur Chariot Race or Sheridan's Ride, and a Sousa March, any one of 136, then the intermission, Second half, a Sousa March, any one of 136. Then a suite, Looking Upward, or People Who Live in Glass Houses, or Tales of a Traveler, or Camera Studies, or At the Movies, or Dwellers of the Western World. Then a Sousa March, any one of 136. Waltz, Lorenda La Mer, or Colonial Dames. A Sousa March, any one of 136 are marching along. And then for the finale, the march, the stars and stripes forever. On the occasion of Sousa's actual 150th birthday, November 6, and in the week following, bands and orchestras around the world paid homage to the March King with performances of Sousa's compositions and programs imitative of the Sousa style. In Washington, D.C., Marine Band leader Lieutenant Colonel Michael Coburn honored Sousa at the Congressional Cemetery gravesite with a program that included Semper Fidelis, The Gladiator, 
The Washington Post and the Stars and Stripes Forever. Later that morning, Colonel Coburn and Captain Jason Fettig presented a program of music for the dedication of the new John Philip Sousa Band Hall and the unveiling of a prototype of Terry Jones's Sousa statue at the new Marine Barracks. The program included the Washington Post, Manhattan Beach, the Bride Elect, Presidential Polonaise and Hands Across the Sea, the Rifle Regiment, El Capitan, Rendell Amare Waltzes, High School Cadets, the Liberty Bell, the Gridiron Club, Corcoran Cadets, the Thunderer, the Black Horse Troop, and the Stars and Stripes Forever. Among the dignitaries present at these events was a delegation of 33 members of the Japan Suzu Society, headed by President Tanimura and Toshiaka Yama. The Society had traveled from Japan expressly for this occasion and hosted a reception that evening. Later that evening, across the country in Cupertino, California, the remainder of the Marine Band was on its annual fall concert tour. Lieutenant Michelle Rakers conducted a birthday program that included marches Nobles of the Mystic Shrine, Sesuke Centennial Exposition, Semper Fidelis and the Stars and Stripes Forever, The Overture to the American Maid, The Sweet Looking Upward, In the Land of the Golden Fleece from Tales of a Traveler, and Selections from the Bride-Elect. In Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, the University of Illinois produced a double salute to Susan. The halftime show of the Illinois-Indiana football game a featured a marching along segment with Gallant and Gay will march away, let's hurrah, we're almost there, El Capitan, King Cotton, The Thunderer, and The Stars and Stripes Forever. The show was noted by and partially broadcast on the CBS Sunday Morning Show. In the evening, the University of Illinois Wind Symphony, dressed as the Sousa Band with James Keene conducting and playing the role of Sousa, Ronnie Rahm as Herbert L. Clark, and Cynthia Heyman Coleman as Diva Marjorie Moody presented a Sousa Spectacular. The program in Sousa style featured music by Fonsupe, Clark, Granger, Puccini, Wagner, and Sousa. Sousa music included The Sweet Looking Upward, Easter Monday on the White House Lawn, Marching Along and March Encores, U.S. Field Artillery, El Capitan, the University of Illinois March, and The Stars and Stripes Forever. In Denver, Colorado, Keith Bryan and the Colorado Symphony presented a gala concert in Sousa style with Keith dressed as Sousa. The concert highlighted numerous Sousa marches as encores. On Sunday, November 7th, 2,000 people packed the Leeds Center in Lawrence, Kansas for a Sousa concert with Robert Foster as Sousa and the band in Sousa band uniforms. Soloists included Steve Lissring as Herbert L. Clark and playing The Bride of the Waves. Also featured were a lyric soprano soloist and a virtuoso xylophonist. The program opened with the Raymond Overture and a Sousa March Encore followed each selection. Semper Fidelis before the intermission, and of course the finale was The Stars and Stripes Forever. On 11 November in Sandfjord, Norway, the Royal Norwegian Navy Band performed an all Sousa concert, which included the Overture Tally Ho, Marches, The Washington Post, The Free Lance, Semper Fidelis, and The Stars and Stripes Forever, by the light of the polar star from looking upward. Two songs, The Goose Girl and Blue Ridge, a violin solo, Nymphalin, The Serenaders from At the Movies, a ragtime dance with pleasure, The Gliding Girl, The Presidential Polonaise, and selections from El Capitan. On 13-14 November at Loyola University in New Orleans, I conducted two concerts, which included Sousa's transcription of the overture to Nikolai's Merry Wives of Windsor, the violin solo Nymphalin, the bride-elect selections, presidential polonaise, Easter Monday on the White House lawn, Sabre and Spurs, and the Stars and Stripes Forever. No single American composer has enriched the repertory of the band more than has John Philip Sousa. It is interesting to note that in the repertoire index of the Eastman Wind Ensemble from 1952 to 1992, the most performed composer was John Philip Sousa, with 57 separate entries, many of them repeated, and in second place was Johann Sebastian Bach with 19. History bears the evidence of a man who captured the hearts of his countrymen and the rhythms of the world. Composers Paul Hindemith and William Schumann 
thought Sousa to be the essence of the American spirit and admired him immensely. It would behoove us to emulate his originality in programming, and also you can be assured that the audience will appreciate the effort. In so doing, as the musical strains of any Sousa march resounds and fades into the ether, we can be proud that we are keeping in step with Sousa. Sousa closed his biography marching along with this comment, quote, If out of the cadences of time I have evoked one note that clear and true vibrates gratefully on the heartstrings of my public, I am well content, End quote. That one note, or should we say that brilliant melange of notes from the vast musical literature composed by the immortal Sousa, is now the National March of the United States the stars and stripes forever.